Dead America, the Second Month, The Portland Conflict, Part 1 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Rebuild Plus 8 Day Zero Plus 38 The sun rose over the city of Portland. The streets filled with roving gangs of the undead, lured back towards the centre of town thanks to a military missile strike a couple of weeks prior. Even though the sounds of the bombs had long since ceased, the smouldering remains filled the area with thick smoke, like a beacon to the lumbering dead who were attracted to anything moving. Zion sat in a small house a few blocks to the east of the river. His back pushed firmly up against the headboard of the bed, head still a little foggy from just waking up. Even though they had the house firmly secured and the stairs up to the second floor barricaded, he didn't sleep well. He hadn't slept well since the attack. His sister, Monique, and others in their group had forgiven the military for their transgressions, knowing it must have been for a bigger purpose. Even though they didn't know what the purpose was, they still had faith that they were doing something to combat the zombie apocalypse. Zion, however, still had deep-seated anger towards the military. First it was the group that had gone AWOL and threatened their community killing some of their members in the process, back during the first days of this nightmare. And now, this indiscriminate bombing of their city, their communities, without care or concern for their well-being. He didn't know if there was a reason for it, and even if there was, he didn't care. If it was for a diversion, there were safer and better ways to do it. They could have sent an emissary to help them with the diversions. Or hell, they could have dropped leaflets from the sky, letting them know what was about to happen. Anything. It wasn't like the enemy would have been able to read them and know what was about to happen. The enemy was already dead. Zion shook his head, trying to shake free the anger that gripped his mind. There were things that needed to get done. In the days since the bombing, he'd successfully moved the base camp from Portland down the road to White Salmon, which was sixty miles to the east along the river. However, these weren't the only people under his care. Numerous smaller groups of survivors had dotted the landscape around the city and its suburbs, ranging from a handful of people up to the biggest community of forty. With the zombie threat returning with a vengeance, Zion had little choice but to evacuate those groups to the safety of White Salmon. Most of those groups were relatively easy to reach, as they were largely on the outskirts of town. It had taken effort and a bit of risk, but they'd managed to do it. A hundred and eighty-five people had been pulled from doom and taken to safety. A hundred and eighty-five people with a new lease on life. 185 people that Zion had to take responsibility for. People who needed shelter, which was easy enough to come by, but they were also people who needed food, which was a little more difficult. Some of the college students they had rescued were doing what they could to set up greenhouses, but it was taking time. Zion didn't know if it would take more time than they had given how rapidly they were depleting the local grocery stores. But that was another problem for another day. Today was all about reaching Adam and his group, who were trapped in downtown Portland on the other side of the river. Zion looked out the window, running a hand over his tight afro. Outside, across the neighborhood, dozens of zombies were spread out in the yards and streets. In the distance, a few blocks away stood the bridge over the river. When the apocalypse had begun, people had attempted to flee, and every bridge from downtown over the river was blocked. Wrecks, stalled vehicles, people getting stuck and just wasting away or taking matters into their own hands. 
regardless. There wasn't a way to get a vehicle of their own across. They'd have to go on foot. Zion continued to stare, mentally plotting his route through the mobs below. He knew that by the time they were ready to leave that they'd be in a different position. But he'd been training his mind to think of all situations and how to get through them. He knew there was going to be a situation in the future where he wouldn't have time to think, only to react. It wouldn't be the first time either. As he continued to stare, the morning light glowing on his dark skin, there was a knock at the door. Yeah, it's open, he said hoarsely. The door creaked open, revealing Calvin's wiry frame. You decent? he asked, his hand over his eyes. Zion chuckled. Yeah, I am, he said. You promise? the younger man asked. Don't worry, I'm not going to get one over on you like Fingers did, Zion promised. Calvin let out a sigh of relief, opening the door. He shuddered, looking like he was desperately trying to put the mental image of what Fingers, their explosives expert, had done the week prior. I swear that boy is one sick mofo, he moaned. And weirdly flexible, too, which just... He shuddered again. The clothing-optional prank Fingers had played with his oddly flexible body had been talked about for the entire week. Okay, we need to change the subject to something happier immediately, Calvin declared, or else I might puke. Zion motioned to the window. You can come take a look at what we get to fight our way through here in a bit, he suggested. Yeah, that ought to work, Calvin agreed, and approached the window, peering out without moving the blinds too much. While it was unlikely they'd be spotted, they both knew that all it would take was one of those things spotting the movement, and it would create a crowd in its excitement. He whistled low. Those critters are out early this morning he murmured. That's going to be a bitch to get through. Nah, we'll be all right, Zion said. At least until we get to the bridge. Calvin frowned. Really, man? He groaned. Zion chuckled. Just messing with you, man, he said. I mean, it is going to be a bitch, but it's nothing we haven't dealt with already. Yeah, but some of those dealings, I barely came out the other side with my ass still attached. The younger man whined. How bad you think it is? Zion shook his head. I really don't know, he admitted. Those things have been filtering back in for more than a week now. Some of those bridges are less congested than others. Plus, who knows how many of them wandered back from the west? He straightened up, patting his companion on the back. I think we're going to be in for a fight today. But don't worry, you stick with me and I'll make sure you get through to the other side. Calvin smiled. You are a really good friend, man, he said. Nah, it ain't like that, Zion joked, waving him off. I'm just scared of what your girl Tori would do to me if I came back without you. Hey, Calvin said, giving an overly dramatic pout. What do you want me to say, man? Zion shrugged his broad, linebacker shoulders. She builds all these contraptions, and I just know that she has something stashed away for exactly that occasion. Shit keeps me up at night just thinking about it. Calvin laughed. I'm sure she'd get a kick out of knowing that she frightens you, he teased. Just remember, if you tell her, then it's going to force my hand and I'll have to face my fears, Zion warned playfully. Calvin raised his palms. Okay, okay, your secret is safe with me, he declared. Appreciate that, the taller man replied with a grin. So, you ready to get this little adventure started? Calvin nodded and sighed. Might as well, he said. The two of them left the bedroom, walking down to the first floor of the house. The barricade on the stairs had already been dismantled. When's the last time anybody heard from Adam and his group? Calvin asked as they descended. Zion shook his head. Just before it all went to hell, he said. Monique talked to him the day before, I believe. I think Wendy was preparing to make a supply run over to him, 
because even in those days it was difficult to get to where he was. They said they've been trying to get him on the line since, but no luck. You think he's still there? Calvin asked. The taller man tilted his head back and forth. Unless they took a direct hit, I'm sure they are, he said. You know Adam, tough son of a bitch. Yeah, I know, Calvin agreed. But I wonder what could have caused them to go radio silent. As they walked into the kitchen, they joined Matteo sitting at the table as he laid out a collection of prepackaged breakfast pastries. Hope these are okay, he said, offering a smile. I found them stashed in top of the pantry. Guess the parents were trying to keep them from the kids. Zion picked up a frosted donut stick, excitement rising in his eyes. Man, my mom used to get these for me all the time, he said. She used to have to hide them from me, too, or else I'd eat the entire box. Good man-child memories, huh? Matteo asked. Or six months ago, Calvin quipped. Zion laughed and snatched the younger man's package from his hands as retribution for the joke. I couldn't help but overhear what you two were talking about, Matteo piped up as Calvin jumped up and down, trying to grab his breakfast back out of the taller man's hand. There's a bunch of reasons why Adam could have gone radio silent. Zion nodded as he finally tossed the donut stick back to an out-of-breath Calvin. All right, enlighten us then, he said. Those missiles don't mess around, Matteo said. The impact can send a shockwave like you wouldn't believe rippling through the city. If they had external antennas or solar-powered charges, they could have easily been taken out by the blast, even if the impact was several blocks away. Zion and Calvin exchanged a glance, shrugging and nodding. Not the craziest thing I've ever heard, Zion said. Makes sense. Calvin agreed. So, how's the traffic out there this morning? Matteo asked. Calvin puffed out his chest, using his donut stick as a fake microphone. Congested as hell, he bellowed in a fake announcer voice. Expect heavy delays on the bridge and all roads into downtown. Matteo chuckled. Sadly, doesn't sound all that far off from a normal morning in Portland, he said. They shared a laugh and Zion finished off his breakfast, crumpling up the plastic wrapper and tossing it into the small garbage can by the counter. So, the gear good to go? he asked. Matteo nodded. Yeah, bullets are, well, at a premium, he said. I got a couple of slugs for the shotgun. And I got ten rounds for my hunting rifle, Calvin added. Matteo sighed, spreading his hands. Everything else is going to have to be blunt force trauma, he said. Zion raised his large metal rod that had several four to six inch screws welded into it. It was about five feet long from the top of the handle to the tip, with the handle wrapped in leather. It had been a special creation from Tori and her crew to him. There were bits of dried blood all over it, because this day would be far from its first action. I got that covered he said with a smirk. Matteo shoved his hands in his pockets. So, what's the plan? he asked, leaning against the counter. Right, Zion said, and walked over to his bag, pulling out a map of downtown and putting it on the table. He pointed to areas on the paper as he spoke. Okay, we have to get over the bridge there. Then it's up four blocks over and two blocks up. I doubt we're going to be able to get to their base so we're going to have to improvise. He pointed to a building two blocks over. This is our entry point. Both Matteo and Calvin leaned over the map, then shared a confused glance. Why are we going in there? Matteo asked. Calvin's eyes widened. Oh, God, he breathed. Is that... Zion nodded gravely. Yep, he said. Son of a... Biscuit-eating whore, Calvin cried, slapping his thigh. Matteo blinked, shaking his head. I am so confused right now. It's the sewer building, Calvin said, flinging his hand in disgust towards the map. Come again? Matteo asked, raising an eyebrow. The dam, Calvin grunted, flustered. It's... Ugh. 
We call it the sewer building, Zion cut in. It has access to the sewer system in the basement of it. Going through it won't take us all the way to Adam's building, but we'll be across the street from it. Calvin waved a hand in front of his face. And no matter how badly you think it smells, he warned, it's a thousand times worse. Are there zombies in the sewer? Matteo asked. Zion shook his head. Nope, he said. I'm in then, Matteo said with a shrug. I can always take a river bath when we get back. Can't wash off a bite, though. Calvin's shoulders slumped, and he sighed. Yeah, I know, but... Ugh, he whined. Matteo reached into his bag, pulling out some explosives. Well, once we're there, we can figure out where to place these, he said. Fingers rigged a few of them up. They're not going to do much damage, but should pull them away. Then we just have to hope we can get people out and to the sewers, Calvin added morosely. We'll be fine, Zion said, clapping him on the back. We got transport on this side of the bridge. Just have to get past the first wave and it'll be easy sailing. Hope you're right, Calvin muttered. Zion grinned. You know I am, he said firmly. Matteo picked up the bag of explosives and Zion approached the window looking out front of the house and finding zombies spread out, but still in fairly significant numbers, easily a couple dozen. Let's get geared up, he declared. That sun isn't going to be up forever, and I don't know about you two, but I don't want to get trapped on that side of the river after dark. The two men nodded, quickly getting their gear together. The assault was about to begin. Chapter 2 Zion prepped his weapon, gripping it tightly as a grin spread across his face. He was about to go lay the smack down on some undead goons, which was his favorite part of the day. The other reason for smiling was that this was the last group in need of rescue, which meant this part of the job was almost done. Almost. You guys ready? Matteo asked. Zion nodded. Let's knock this out, he said. Matteo counted down from three and opened the door, and Zion burst through it out into the street. He immediately targeted a zombie on the front walk, swinging his metal bludgeon hard, cracking through the side of the creature's skull and crumpling it to the ground. Getting this day started right, he grunted in satisfaction. He glanced over his shoulder as the other two rushed up behind him, and led them off to the road, where a few more zombies were lumbering up. Their excited moans were attracting the attention of others nearby. Zion wasted no time, stepping up and swinging hard. The impact was so violent on the first creature that it knocked the frail beast clean over, sending its legs into the air and its face smacking hard on the ground. The other two ghouls continued to shamble towards him, and they fared no better in their attempts to have him for breakfast. The other two guys continued to follow Zion as they moved through the middle of the road. The majority of zombies were in the yards and slowly shambling their way, with only a few stragglers in the road itself. After getting in a few kills, Zion's bloodlust was satisfied, so he went into fullback mode, lowering his shoulder and clearing the path for the other two. His hulking frame and speed was too much for the creatures to handle. He knocked ghoul after ghoul to the ground, providing them an easy trip through the neighborhood. As they approached the bridge, the creatures got a little thicker, several of them pressed up against cars that extended past the edge of the bridge, unable to figure out how to squeeze in through the cracks between them. Zion stopped a few yards from the edge of them which were about eight that had turned and focused on the trio. He went into berserker mode, swinging his weapon rapidly from side to side. After taking out several in this way, he switched up to a vertical attack, bringing the weapon straight down onto the heads of the ghouls, turning them into a lifeless pile of bone and rotted flesh on the ground. Within a matter of moments, he had laid waste to the threat at the edge of the bridge, Calvin and Matteo stood several yards behind him, 
watching with awe as he demolished the threat. Before they could say anything, he turned, grinning, dark blood stains all over his clothes. All right, up on the cars, let's go, he said. The two men glanced at each other and shrugged, not saying anything in response to his rampage, but clearly inferring, glad he's on our side, in their gazes. The three of them clambered up onto the tops of the vehicles, which were tightly packed all the way across the bridge with various narrow pathways going through the traffic jam. There were also a considerable number of zombies lingering on the bridge, most forever trapped in the labyrinth of twisted metal. Watch those arms now, Zion warned. They can't grab, but they can sure trip you up. Both men nodded as they continued their trip over the vehicles, making sure not to get tripped up by the outstretched arms of the zombie masses. When they got halfway across, they looked to the other side, the moans of the ghouls and the sounds of their footsteps beginning to draw a crowd. Zion! Calvin barked up. Up ahead! The man in question looked up spotting a few dozen ghouls coming out of the downtown area, headed towards the bridge, but were about thirty yards from the edge of it. Zion sped up, putting some distance between Calvin and Matteo. When he got to the edge, he leapt off, clearing a few creatures at the end of the bridge. Zion landed hard on the ground, running off towards the mob that was slowly forming. Luckily, they were spread out a few yards from each other, allowing him to operate. Zion started swinging his weapon wildly, smacking skulls and sending the smaller zombies toppling head over heels. He was like a man possessed, demolishing creature after creature and holding the mob at bay while the other two got to the edge of the bridge, leaping over the few at the edge. The duo ignored the zombies behind them, instead running towards Zion, Calvin giving him a whistle when they were close. Let's move, Zion instructed. Couple blocks away. He led the trio past the initial mob that had formed, turning his weapon horizontally across his body and using it as a blockade, hitting ghouls in the chest and knocking them back over. It didn't take long until they'd broken through the initial wave of zombies, which opened them up to the road where there were scattered ghouls, but none in packs bigger than three or four. They ran hard through the road, not worrying about their foot noise, just wanting to get to their destination as quickly as possible. They made it through the first block, Zion pausing long enough to crack a ghoul in the head while getting his bearings. This way, he said. Calvin and Matteo continued to follow him through the increasingly populated streets of downtown Portland. The buildings were beginning to get larger as they went, with single stories turning into three or four, the occasional two-story thrown in. The larger buildings, the skyscrapers, were in the distance, about a mile away. Zion continued to lead the charge, cracking skulls and shoving beasts out of the way over the next block. It was becoming increasingly more difficult to do so as the zombies grew thicker. They made it to the target block, and the road ahead was completely impassable, with a few hundred ghouls packed in tightly most of them facing towards the direction the group was heading. Rather than panic, Zion held up the group long enough to find the door to the target building. Calvin, that door should still be latched from the outside, he said. You get it open, and you two get inside. I'll hold down the fort. The wiry man nodded, and the trio took off towards the building. Zion lowered his shoulder and plowed through several zombies to clear the path for them. When they reached it, Calvin immediately rushed over to unlatch the door, which had been hastily drilled in to hold it shut. As soon as he popped that open, the door swung in, the locking mechanism long broken, casualty of a previous run. Zion swung and took out a couple of zombies as the others rushed inside. We're in! Calvin cried. Zion turned and flew in, slamming the door behind him. Calvin grabbed a bar to put on their side to hold it tight. There was immediate banging on the door from the angry mob of ghouls outside, desperate for their flesh. Got some lanterns over there, Zion said, motioning. Matteo stepped over and picked up a few camping lanterns, firing them up. He handed one to Calvin 
and shone the way for Zion, who led them through the large office building. He walked with confidence, unconcerned about any threats. Should we be moving this quickly? Mateo asked. Relax, we cleared this place out a few weeks ago, Zion replied with a wave of his hand. It's locked up tight, so nothing is getting in or out unless it's through that door. Let's hope you're right, Mateo said dryly. Zion led them through the cubicle farm and towards the maintenance door near the back. He threw it open and found a stairwell leading down. They paused for a moment to listen for trouble, but didn't hear anything. Calvin gagged at the putrid smell. You good? Mateo asked. Man, I don't know what it is, the shorter man moaned. Thousands of rotting corpses don't bother me. But damned if whatever is down there hits me like a cow patty in the face. Mateo shook his head. Just breathe through your mouth, he suggested. Oh yeah, Calvin drawled. So instead of breathing a cow patty, I can eat it. Great. Just trying to help, Mateo said with a shrug. Cut the chatter, Zion snapped. We got work to do. You know where we're going? Mateo asked. Zion nodded. Yeah. We're hanging a left, then a right, he explained. The tunnels here connect to several buildings over a few blocks. We can get around a bit, but it's easy to get turned around down here. Mateo and Calvin shut up and nodded, and he led them through the underground sewer. The camping lights reflected off of the bricks and water as they walked, Calvin fighting the whole way not to gag and retch at the smell. They made it underneath the next building, finding the stairwell that went up. Calvin, Zion said. He broke formation. On it, he said, and darted up the stairs to check the door, making sure it was still shut. It didn't have emergency release, so there was no threat of a zombie being able to turn the knob and open it. We're good, he said, coming back down the stairs to rejoin them in the tunnel. They made the turn, heading up towards the target building. Zion led them up the stairs, pausing at the top. Before he opened the door, he pressed his ear against it, listening closely. Damn it, he murmured. Calvin winced. Trouble? he asked quietly. Sounds like we have a few, Zion replied. One of those windows must have finally given out, Calvin said. The taller man turned to him. I thought you plugged that, he asked. We did, Calvin protested, then stammered. I mean, sort of. Zion's gaze darkened. What does sort of mean? He demanded. I mean, we put up one of those cubicle walls and pushed a couple big-ass desks against it, Calvin explained. Not like we really had an option to run down to the hardware department at the supercenter. Zion listened again, focusing on the little bit of movement and quiet moans. Doesn't sound like there's too many of them he said. Is there not another building we can go to? Mateo asked, running a hand through his hair nervously. This is the closest one to Adam's garage, Zion replied. The other one is Kitty Corner. Plus, we'd have to backtrack a lot. Mateo opened his mouth, but Zion raised a hand to shut him up. Relax, he said. We can handle what's in there. Let's go. He gripped his weapon tightly, before gently turning the knob and peeking inside. There was nothing immediately close to him, so he slipped inside, entering at the back side of an open office. There were half a dozen zombies moving about in between the cubicles. He looked to the window on the left, where the desks had been forced back just enough that a few ghouls could shimmy their way through the opening. Past that, the street was a mass of zombies packed tightly, with no daylight between them. He tapped Calvin, pointing to the window, motioning for him to shove the desks back in place. The shorter man nodded and tapped Matteo to help him out so they could reinforce the barricade better. Once they were off on their task, Zion walked into the middle of the cubicle room, staying low and quiet, not wanting to do anything to excite the ghouls in the building, for fear it would cause a rush at the entrance point. Zion moved silently only popping up to confront a ghoul. He grabbed the first one he came across, 
yanking it to the ground before shoving the tip of his weapon into the back of its head. It wasn't as fun of a kill as he would like, but it was a lot quieter. As Zion moved around the room, silently dispatching creatures, Calvin and Matteo moved to the side of the building, staying in the shadows against a wall to take stock of the situation, before rushing in. There was about a two-foot gap in the cubicle wall, but nothing was trying to get in at the moment. Calvin motioned that he was going to shove that closed and motioned for Matteo to push the desks behind him, and received a thumbs up. The two of them quickly broke from position, running alongside the window, knowing they had seconds before they'd be attracting attention from the outside. Calvin quickly made it to the cubicle wall, slamming it flush against the broken window frame before anything outside noticed. The noise, however, did get their attention, and he immediately felt resistance pushing against it. Desk! 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 he hissed. Matteo came around, grabbing the side of the heavy wooden desk and pushing it forward against the barricade. It's there, he said. Calvin cautiously let go, making sure it was staying put. After a brief second to ensure he was right, he jumped behind the desk and helped Matteo push. They got two desks against it before Calvin pointed to a third. Come on, let's put this one on top, he said. The duo dragged it over, straining to lift it off of the ground, before flipping it and slapping it on top. Once it was on there, they pressed it hard against the cubicle wall, stepping back and breathing heavily. Damn, what the hell are they making these things out of? Calvin huffed. Company sprung for the good stuff, that's for sure. Matteo said. You boys done over there? Zion called. Calvin turned towards his voice. Yeah, we're good, he called back. You? All clear, came the reply. Let's get up to the roof and see what we can see. They grabbed their lanterns and headed up the emergency staircase, pausing at the door to make sure they were alone. They got up to the top of the stairs, climbing up the ladder to the roof. Sunlight bathed the landing as the trap door opened up. Zion went up first, stretching his arms out as he walked slowly to the edge of the building, looking out towards Adam's garage. He looked down at the intersection, where the entirety of it plus all roads leading to it were completely filled with ghouls. Holy mother of pearl, Calvin breathed as he joined him. I've never seen it this bad down here. What the hell happened? Matteo pointed from his other side. Might have something to do with that, he said. Kitty corner to them, past the other building that was directly across from the garage, was a collapsed building. There were tons of debris on the road, creating a blockade to their north and east. Looks like a direct hit, Matteo continued. Calvin's brow furrowed. Figured there would be more damage, he said. Zion shook his head. Could have hit a few blocks over, he said. In fact, wasn't that parking deck we had to climb down a few blocks that way? They turned towards downtown, where they had a clear view. Yeah, I think you're right, Calvin mused. And now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure there were some more tall buildings that way. Explosion that size would be pulling those things in from everywhere, Matteo murmured. They get up here, get caught on the rubble, and have no place to go. And I'm sure Adam and his group make noise from time to time, Calvin added. Speaking of, let's see if they're home, Zion said, and cupped a hand around his mouth. Adam! he yelled. Yo! Anybody in there? The others joined in with the yelling hoping to get somebody's attention. The mechanic's garage across from them was roughly two stories tall, so they were ever so slightly looking down at them. It took a couple of minutes of yelling before there was movement. The hatch on the roof finally popped open and Adam climbed out, walking over to the edge. Been wondering when you were going to make a house call, he called. Sorry, brother, Zion said. It's been a hell of a couple of weeks. Adam nodded. Yeah, tell me about it, he replied. You have any idea what in the hell happened? 
Damn military rained some missiles down on us, Zion replied, shaking his head. Adam blinked at him, dumbfounded. What? he asked. Why? Man, I got nothing firm, Zion admitted. Heard some rumors over the radio that they were launching some sort of offensive in Seattle, but we don't know for sure. Been too busy getting to everybody in our camps to really care, if I'm being honest. So, people are making it through okay? Adam asked. Zion nodded. So far, so good, he replied. Now we just gotta figure out what we're going to do about you. We're going to need wings from the looks of it, Adam said, shaking his head. Zion shrugged. Fresh out of those, but we got some explosives, he said. Maybe we can lure those things away from your door, at least long enough to get you over to this building. We can take the sewers out. That's great and all, but I don't know if we're going to be able to manage that, the other man said, shaking his head slowly. At least without an assault to go along with it. Zion's brow furrowed. What do you mean? he asked. As you can imagine, we don't really have a lot to do around here, Adam explained, waving a hand around his head vaguely. So a few of us have been looking out, watching those things wander around. Everything to the west of us is jam-packed with zombies. Shit, Zion muttered. Mateo cocked his head. What? he asked. If those things are as packed as he says, Calvin piped up. Then if we detonate a diversion device, all it's going to do is bring two groups together from both sides. We won't be able to pull this group away. Mateo sighed with a begrudging nod. Don't worry about it. We're going to figure something out, Zion said loudly. Might take us a few more days, but if it's the last thing I do, I'm getting you out of there. Adam offered a smile. Appreciate that, he said. How you doing with supplies? Zion asked. We're good on water, Adam replied. Rain the last few days, so we were able to restock. Food, however, well, that don't fall from the sky. What you working with? Zion asked. We're rationing pretty good, Adam replied, putting his hands on his hips. Easily four days. Could stretch it to five, although it wouldn't be comfortable. Stick to your four days, Zion said. If we don't have a viable plan in the next 48 hours, I'm coming back with food for you. The other man cocked a brow, skepticism clear in his tone. Hope you throw in arms good, he drawled, because that's going to be a hell of a toss to get anything over here. Nah, it's all good, Calvin put in. We're up high enough. I can grab one of my hunting bows and shoot a lead line over to you. Get us a zipline buffet going. Zion perked up at that thinking hard for a moment before turning to his companion. Think we could rig up something to get them over here? he asked. Calvin paused, as if he hadn't even entertained that idea, mulling it over and finally shrugging. Wouldn't be my first choice, and we'd need some serious climbing-grade rope, he said, and some way to attach it to the buildings. I mean, it's not entirely outside the realm of possibility, but shouldn't be the first option. I'll keep noodling with it and see what I can come up with. We'll figure it out, Zion promised. In the meantime, you stay safe. We're going to get you out. Adam offered a hopeful smile. I know you will, he replied. You boys be safe out there. You know us, Zion said with a smirk. I do. That's why I said it, Adam quipped. Zion chuckled and waved, and the other man disappeared back into the garage shutting the roof door behind him. The trio turned to each other on their rooftop. So, what in the hell are we doing now? Calvin asked, spreading his hands. Little early to be heading back to base, ain't it? Not to mention fuel isn't exactly prevalent, Matteo added. Might as well make the most of our time out here. Store one? Calvin suggested. Zion pursed his lips. Maybe, he murmured. The wiry stoner cocked his head, staring up at his friend. So, where you want to go, big fella? he asked. We should go check out our old home, Zion finally said. Calvin blinked at him. The apartments? he asked. Yeah, Zion replied with a nod. 
We left there in a hurry. Been too focused on getting people out of danger to worry about going back. We were well stocked there and can't imagine we got it all out. Calvin shook his head vehemently. Nowhere close to it, he confirmed. Then snapped his fingers in excitement. Hell, there's a hunting bow there too. We can go ahead and get them some food, stock them up for a couple weeks, buy us a little time to get them out. Plenty of daylight left, Mateo said. Should have the time to knock it out. Zion nodded firmly. All right, we got us a plan for the rest of the day, he said. Shall we let Adam know we'll be back? Mateo asked, jerking a thumb over his shoulder towards the garage. Zion shook his head. Nah, might not be back until tomorrow, he said. Don't know what the old homestead is looking like. Might take us longer than we think. Don't want to put us on an artificial timetable so we keep folks from worrying. Makes sense, Mateo agreed. Calvin let out a long sigh. All right, I guess it's time to hit the sewers again, he groaned. Zion chuckled and clapped him on the shoulder. Don't worry, bud. We gotta go back to the house to pick up the truck anyway, he said. You'll have time to change. Thank the Almighty, the shorter man bellowed, raising his arms to the heavens. I don't want to be smelling like this the rest of the day. Come on, let's get a move on, Zion said. The trio headed back down the ladder, preparing for their journey back across the zombie-infested city. Chapter 3 Sergeant Boris and his team were holed up in a grocery store to the east of the interstate in the little town of Centralia, Washington. He was part of a forward team of about a hundred soldiers, tasked with locating goods that could be of use, things like ammunition, food, and medicine. He was also tasked with creating interstate barricades in case of a mob of creatures coming from the south. The group of six had been in the store for the last few hours, basically since before the sun came up, taking notes about what was on the shelves, what was still edible, and staging the good stuff by the front door. It was back-breaking, thankless work. Somebody remind me of how we pulled this shit detail? Private Sterling asked, stretching out his tall frame. His boyish face contorted as he twisted his torso back and forth, crackling his spine. Corporal Sheehan shot him a dry look, hefting a box of macaroni with his stocky arms. Because Captain Odom recommended us for it, he said. So what did we do to piss him off? Private Harden asked, jogging on the spot to work out kinks in his muscular calves. The corporal shook his head. It's not like that, he insisted. In that initial assault, there were a few groups that really shone under the pressure. Sergeant Dickerson and his group, Jinx and his group, and our very own Sergeant Burris and his merry band of misfits. The sergeant in question grunted, his trademark permanent scowl etched across his burly face. Don't you just love being the victims of our own success? he growled. Yeah, Sergeant, it's some bullshit, Private Bingham agreed, shaking his head. If I had known that slacking off would have meant we got to stay in Olympia, I wouldn't have lifted a damn finger. Private Stinson cocked a brow. I was there, Bingham. Let's just say you got graded on a curve, she drawled. There was some ooze through the group, and Bingham chuckled as he flipped to the bird. Settle down, settle down, she embarked. Let's get this done so we can move on to the next dangerous and menial task. He walked over to the front window, looking out from behind boxes at dozens of zombies wandering around in the parking lot. There were several dead ones on the ground, some beaten and some run over. They'd been part of the second wave into town with Corporal Jinx and his crew responsible for being the decoys and main attackers. As a result, the number of ghouls they had to deal with was minimal. How's it looking out there, Corporal? Boris asked gruffly. I'm not the biggest fan of Jinx. He's too reckless for my taste. But the boy knows how to cause a disturbance, Sheehan admitted. 
When I saw this place on the map, I thought it would be bogged down for days. Don't know how he did it, but he managed to pull most of those things out of here. There's a reason he hasn't made sergeant yet, Boris muttered. The corporal cocked a brow. But they still gave him his own crew? he asked. The sergeant nodded. Captain Odom likes him, he said. Plus, with everything going on these days, guess the captain thought he could handle it. He shrugged. I don't know. Who am I to judge? We had a leisurely drive in. He let out a huff, crossing his arms. You good, Sarge? Sheehan asked slowly, brow furrowing. Yeah, just, Boris said with a sigh, trailing off and shaking his head. Just tired of this nonsense. We're not the only people in this military. Just wondering why we have to keep being the tip of the spear. The corporal nodded. I know, Sarge, he said softly. Right there with you. He reached over to a box that was stacked up in front of the window, pulling out a small box of snack cakes. He ripped into it, handing one of the prepackaged ones and handing it over to Boris. At least we have perks, right? If we don't write it down, it doesn't exist. The sergeant chuckled as he took the treat. He motioned towards the others. Might as well spread the wealth, he said. Sheehan nodded and headed off to distribute the goods as Burris turned back to looking out the window. As he ate his cake, he let his mind wander. He shook off some of the horrific things he'd seen since they'd made landfall during this invasion. So much death and destruction, losing several of his men in the process. Why were they still being forced out? Why were they still being thrown to the wolves? Why aren't they given time to recuperate, not just physically, but mentally? A seed of anger began to sprout from within him, but he tamped it down, knowing that it wasn't going to do any good. As he did that, he looked out and spotted a truck driving up. Look alive, people. We got company, he said over his shoulder. Civilians? Sterling asked as he approached him. The corporal shook his head. Can't be. Everybody should have been cleared out by now, he said. The truck swerved to hit one of the zombies, sending it flying across the lot. No, that's definitely one of ours, Boris said. The truck pulled up, coming to a stop. A couple of soldiers popped out of the back, armed with guns, something that the sergeant didn't expect to see given the complete lack of ammunition. One of the men reached back in and pulled out a large duffel bag. Everything they had found was being allocated to the main Seattle defenses. The passenger side opened up, and it was a familiar, distinguished face topped with graying hair. Shit, it's Captain Odom, Boris said, blinking rapidly. A couple of the privates quickly devoured their snack cakes, not wanting to risk a reprimand. Boris rushed over to the front door, unlatching it and letting the men inside. Captain, good to see you, he greeted. Sergeant Burris, how goes it? Odom said, sauntering in like he owned the place. Good, sir, good, Burris replied. Just about half this store wrapped up. We have three more stops in this neighborhood, nothing big. Just a hardware store and a couple smaller restaurants. The captain nodded. That's good work, Sergeant, he said. Do me a favor. Have one of your men write down the other places on your list so it can be handed off. Burris blinked at him. We being reassigned? he asked. You are, Odom replied. The sergeant cocked a smile, half joking, when he asked. Don't suppose it's back to civilization, is it? The captain sighed. Wish it was, sergeant, he said, shaking his head. Wish it was. He inclined his head, looking past Burris. Corporal Sheehan, join us, if you will. Boys, give them a hand with whatever they need so they can get wrapped up. His guards nodded and walked off, and the trio walked over to another part of the store, where there was a display table filled with long dead plants. Odom extended his arm and shoved several of them off, sending pottery flinging halfway across the room before slamming a map down on the tabletop. The sound boomed, echoing throughout the quiet building, which startled even the captain. Apologies, 
he said, shaking his head. That was a little more intense than I intended it to be. Sheehan raised an eyebrow. Just keeping us on our toes, he said. The captain chuckled. Glad you see it that way, Corporal. Because you're going to need to be on your toes for this one, he said. The other two men exchanged a concerned look and then fixed their attention as he began to speak. As you boys know, at the start of this whole invasion operation, somebody decided it would be a good idea to send a few cruise missiles down to Portland, Odom began. From what I understand, the thinking was that the noise would draw back a huge mob that was lingering on the interstate. Not really sure how much of a threat that was going to be for us, but it wasn't my call to make, so it is what it is. However, he pulled out a few printouts of satellite images, which showed some devices in the middle of the interstate with a circle of death around them. Somebody back at HQ found these. What the hell is that? Xi'an blurted, squinting at the photos. Odom pulled out another image from roughly the same perspective, but it didn't have the device or circle of death. That I can't tell you, he admitted, but we know that they weren't there before the bombs dropped. So you think there are civilians there? Burris asked. I think somebody above us fucked up royally thinking it was an empty area, and ended up sending a horde of those things to their doorstep, the captain replied. Boris shook his head. So what do you want us to do? he asked. I want you to go down and be ambassadors of goodwill, Odom said. The sergeant and the corporal stared blankly at him, unsure of what to say. I want you to go see if we can be of any assistance to them, the captain continued. There have been some incidents, and the brass is worried that if we don't act, we could be creating a new enemy. Sheehan cocked a brow. Enemy? he asked. Lots of militia up in these parts, Boris explained. Can't imagine they were too happy with us up and abandoning them at the start of all this. Can only imagine what dropping a few bombs on their head made them feel. Which is why we need you down there. Odom said firmly. See if there are survivors. Help out in any way you can. Burris growled. And if they're hostile? He asked, more than a touch of venom in his tone. The seed of anger inside of him sprouted new branches at the audacity of this man, sending him and his men on what amounted to a suicide mission. If they're hostile, you do what you gotta do, Sergeant, Odom said with a shrug. Just... No unnecessary risks. Understood, Boris replied sharply. The captain pointed to the map, honing in on a shopping center that was circled north of Portland. This is the first shopping center that's north of their position, and really the only thing headed away from the city for quite a while, he said. I want you to start there, looking for anything that could be useful, clues to where they might have gone. He circled an apartment complex with his finger. This is your next target, where we believe their base was. The corporal stared at it, shaking his head. What drew you to that conclusion? he asked. Well, it's a mid-rise apartment complex that's off the beaten path, Odom explained. In the right hands, it could be turned into a fortress. If I had to set up camp, I can think of worse places. If it's a fortress, then do you expect them to still be there? Burris asked. The captain shook his head. Negative, he replied. Ever since this was discovered, our people have been checking in on it with the satellites. Nothing has come in or out of there, and there are several packs of those things wandering around it. If people were living there, those things would have sniffed them out by now. So you want us to locate them, make contact, and then what? Boris asked, more than a little petulantly. Try to bring them to our side, Odom replied. Find out how many there are, and let us know what they need. Supplies are low, but it's in everyone's interest to keep the peace. So we will give them whatever they need. The sergeant stared at the map for a few moments, calculating how far they would have to go, with no backup. 
the seed of anger grew a few more branches. Permission to speak freely, Captain, he said through gritted teeth. Spit it out, Sergeant, Odom agreed. We have been through the ringer, Burris said, tapping a firm finger on the table for emphasis. Every single one of my men, myself included, has watched our people die. We have been the tip of the spear since this thing began, with no rest, no chance to recover physically or mentally. And now you want to send us into a situation where we're going to have those things on one side of us, and potentially an armed and pissed-off militia on the other? He threw up his hands. Do you have any good news to share with us, Captain? Or, at the very least, have enough spare bullets so we can put one in our heads? Odom stared at him for a moment not showing his hand with any expression change whatsoever. He seemed to chew it over for a moment, and then nodded, his tone sympathetic when he spoke. Sergeant, I know you and your team have been through a lot, more than most, I would imagine, he said. But the truth is, we don't have a lot of teams capable of pulling this off in the time frame we need it to be done in. What about Jinx? Sheehan cut in. Odom glared at him for a beat, as if he were going to chew him out for the interruption, but seemed to give him a break given the situation. Corporal, I'll level with you. Jinx was my first choice for this operation, he admitted. Your team is good, but he's a maniac with a bushel of four-leaf clovers shoved up his ass. But he's currently dealing with a situation on the west side of town. What is it this time? she asked. Rounding up a few thousand of those things into the local community center in order to bring it down on top of them, Odom replied. The corporal thought for a moment before giving a conciliatory nod that the captain was right, an apology without words. Now, I realize this is a tough mission. So, Odom trailed off, letting out a loud whistle. One of the men that had come with him jogged over carrying a duffel bag. He tossed it onto the table. Brought you all a goodie bag, the captain said, and unzipped it, revealing a bevy of ammunition and a small plastic snap case on top. A few boxes of ammo might have fallen off a truck headed for Seattle. You each have three mags for your rifles and two for your sidearm. From the way I understand it, your team is the most heavily armed unit in the entire military at the moment. Sheehan and Burris exchanged a glance that clearly said, well, it could be worse then turned back to Odom as he picked up the snapcase. He opened it, revealing some small plastic tags with an on-off switch. And you may feel like you're alone, but you won't be, he said. The two soldiers each picked up a small device inspecting it. What in the world is this? she asked. That, Corporal, is a tracking device, specifically made for luggage, Odom explained. You flip it on, and using the device that came with it, you can see where it is. So you'd slip it into your luggage on a cross-country flight and keep tabs on it. Sergeant Dickerson and his team came across one of those fancy rich person gadget stores and thought these could be useful. Burris nodded approvingly. Kind of surprised the batteries still work on them, he said. We managed to charge them, so they should be good to go, Odom assured them. However... We're not going to be using them to keep tabs on you. The corporal furrowed his brow. You're not? he asked. The captain shook his head. No, we're going to be using them as distress beacons, he explained. So if you get down there and find trouble, all you have to do is turn it on and hang tight, because reinforcements will be on the way. Or at least a handful of people in a truck, Boris said dryly. Odom rolled his eyes. Something, something, beggars, choosers, he drawled. The sergeant sighed. Fair enough, Captain, he said. Okay, Odom said. You have free reign to stock up on whatever supplies you want from here. Food, drinks. He motioned to the corner of his mouth while eyeing the corporal. Some of those tasty snack cakes. Sheehan's eyes grew wide as he wiped his mouth frantically, finding a tiny bit of chocolate that had lingered from his snack. Transportation? Burris asked. Already arranged, Odom replied. Sergeant Dickerson has pulled a vehicle for you and has it gassed up. They're setting up the barricade at the south end of town on the interstate. Meet up with him there. 
We'll be on the way shortly, Burris replied with a firm nod. The captain extended his hand, and as they shook, he leaned in and lowered his voice. Once you get through this, I'll make sure you get downtime, Sergeant, he said. You have my word on it. The seed of anger that had been blossoming ceased for a moment. Burris wasn't sure if Odom would ever live up to his word, probably knowing that this was a suicide mission and he just needed to say something to keep them motivated. But it was something at least. I'm going to have someone monitoring that tracking device every second until you're back, the captain said as he stepped back. You be safe. We'll do our best, Captain, Burris promised. Odom and his men left, firing off a few shots as they exited the door, taking out a few ghouls in the process that were a little too close for comfort. The rest of the group came walking over to Burris and Sheehan. So, what's the deal, Sergeant? Harden asked. Burris took a deep breath, facing the team. We have a new mission, he said. It's not going to be a fun one, he motioned to the bag on the table. But at least we're not going out empty-handed. Stock up on whatever you want from the store, Sheehan instructed. Make sure to get water. We're on the move in ten. Go. The privates nodded and ran back into the store, grabbing handfuls of their favorite treats and shoving them in a bag. Sheehan came back over to Burris, both of them somber. Penny for your thoughts, Burris? Sheehan asked. The sergeant shook his head. Trust me, Corporal. You don't want to know what's going on in my head he said morosely. Sheehan took a deep breath. You don't think we're coming back, do you? he asked. Hundred miles from the nearest support, most likely walking into a hornet's nest, Burris said, shaking his head. If we do come back, it's going to be a miracle. Chapter 4 Burris and his group walked through a lightly populated neighborhood towards the southern part of town, just a few blocks away from the interstate. Privates Bingham and Sterling were spread out ahead of the pack, smacking down the occasional ghoul that shambled in their direction. Private Harden ran up ahead to check the path forward. Most of the creatures were either gone or already on the ground, their heads caved in. They really are trying to kill us, aren't they, Sarge? Stinson asked dryly. Boris laughed humorlessly. Seems that way some days, doesn't it? He asked. And we're just supposed to go along with it? She snapped. The alternative is going AWOL, Sheehan said. At least the AWOL people might see the sun come up tomorrow, she muttered. You want to run, Stinson? Boris asked, his tone flat. I mean, I've heard worse ideas, she admitted. It's not like they're going to send the MPs to track me down. Hell. They barely had the manpower to hold the fort in Seattle. That's enough, Sheehan snapped. We get it. This is a shit detail. You don't have to remind us. Yeah, I guess, she muttered. Still, she trailed off, staring off in the distance, likely thinking about what she'd do if she did make a run for it. Hey, Sarge, found us a way up to the interstate, Harden called as he jogged back over towards them. One more block over. Resistance? Sheehan asked. Harden shook his head. Already dealt with, he said. Wasn't much there to begin with. All right, let's go catch our ride, Boris said. The group walked through the rest of the neighborhood, coming up to a grassy embankment that led up to the interstate. It took them a moment to get to the top, but once they were up there, they saw an impressive sight. There were probably forty or fifty cars that had been pushed onto the interstate. There was a full line of them, pressed side by side together as if they were racing down the highway. Behind that, the cars were turned sideways, doors to the back bumpers of the other vehicles. Once they were in place, one of the soldiers used a knife to stab out the tires, creating a more formidable roadblock. As the group made it to the road, a few of the soldiers noticed them giving a whistle to Sergeant Dickerson, who was near the front, helping to push a car in place. You got that, Dickerson? Boris asked as they approached. He grunted and wiped his brow. Yeah, just angering the muscles, that's all, he said. The two sergeants shook hands. To anyone else, it would have appeared like they were old friends. 
but in reality they weren't familiar with each other until they'd been on the boat headed to the northwest. But after surviving the past couple of weeks, working together, they were bonded. So, heard you were taking a day trip to Portland, Dickerson said. Boris sighed. Here's hoping it's just a day trip, he said. Between you and me, it's a shit detail, Dickerson admitted. Oh, don't worry, I told Captain Odom something to that effect, Boris assured him. Pretty sure he agrees with the both of us. Needs to be done, though, Dickerson said. Boris shrugged. Yeah, I know. Doesn't mean we have to be happy about it, he said. The two sergeants laughed as they walked towards the front of the barricade, hopping up onto the cars to walk over. Sorry about the mess, but we need to make this as secure as we can, Dickerson said. If the mob gets big enough, it's not going to stop them, but it might buy us some time. Looks like you're doing a hell of a job so far, Boris commended. Let's hope, the other man said. Anybody heard from Jinx lately? Sheehan asked. As if on cue, there was a large explosion in the distance, maybe a mile away. It was large enough that the sound was significant, but not deafening. Dickerson chuckled, pointing in the direction of the blast. Pretty sure he's somewhere over there, he said. The corporal laughed too. Yeah, figures he'd show me up like that, he said. He's a little crazy, but he's getting the job done, Dickerson said. We can count on two hands the number of those things that have gotten in our way while constructing this monstrosity. Let's hope he keeps it up then, Boris said, and smirked as he surveyed the construction. Now when we get back, I expect to see this stretching back a couple more rows. We'll see what we can do, Boris, Dickerson joked. They hopped down off of the cars and headed towards the two large SUVs parked in front of the barricade. Okay, here you go, Dickerson said. Best vehicles we could find. Four-wheel drive, luxury package so you got your heated seats and CD players. Even found you a binder full of CDs, too. Don't know if there's anything good in there, but better than the static you would be hearing if all you had was radio. Sheehan peered in through one of the windows. Fuel? he asked. All gassed up and an emergency five-gallon drum in the back of each two, Dickerson said. You should have plenty to get you down there and back without much trouble. Also have some short-range walkie-talkies in there so you can chat. The two sergeants shook hands again as they loaded up the vehicles. Boris offered a strained smile. Appreciate it, he said. You'll be safe now, Dickerson replied, though it was unspoken between them that it would be a very difficult task. Boris nodded and got into the driver's seat of one of the vehicles, Sheehan in the other. All right, buckle up, the sergeant barked. Here we go. He fired it up, popping the vehicle into drive and taking off down the interstate towards Portland his corporal following close behind. Chapter 5 Boris drove the convoy down the interstate, keeping it at a reasonable forty miles an hour. There were still a few cars on the road, and the occasional corpse walking or fallen in the way. The last thing he needed to do was risk a wreck. The music blaring from the speakers was from a seventies rock band, hard and fast. It wasn't really Boris's thing, but Harden and Stinson were both enjoying it, so he let it play. He was just happy that a couple of his crew could enjoy a few moments, because those had been few and far between over the last few weeks. Stinson checked her map. Sarge, looks like it's the next exit for the shopping center, she said. Okay, thank you, Boris replied. He stared out, a bit of fear twisting his guts. He knew in his bones that this whole thing could go very, very bad. He pulled out his walkie, raising it to his lips. Okay, Sheehan, we're coming up on the exit. We're stopping at the top. Copy that, Sorge, the corporal replied. Boris pulled off of the interstate, stopping at a gas station at the top of the hill. There were a few ghouls wandering around the building, but no others within a couple hundred yards. Harden, Stinson, he instructed. Both of them made noises in the affirmative as they got out of the SUV, 
drawing their knives and walking quickly towards the threat. The creatures were spread out pretty well, making them easy prey. After a few quick stabs to the head and dismissive tosses to the ground, the group was truly alone. Okay, on me, Burris said, waiting for his team to reach him. Listen up, you all know what our orders are, but Captain Odom isn't here, so we're going to do this my way. The soldiers all exchanged glances, nodding in agreement. Obviously, we want things to be peaceful, but we need to realize that if there are more survivors here, they most likely aren't going to be happy to see us, he continued. If anybody so much as raises a weapon in your direction, you have permission to go hot. We can deal with the consequences of that later. My only concern is with getting us all home today. After a brief moment of everyone nodding, Sheehan raised his hand. I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you, Sarge, he said firmly. You're my responsibility, and I'm going to get you home or die trying, Boris declared. Come on, let's go check out this shopping center. The group started walking along the frontage road, which led to a large shopping center about three quarters of a mile away. The road went down, giving them a bird's eye view of the complex. They stopped about halfway there, taking stock of it. There were a few dozen zombies in the lot, milling about. A couple of the stores were broken into, with zombies going in and out freely. The supercenter, however, appeared to be locked up tight, with a few ghouls pressed up against the door trying to get inside. What do you think? Sheehan asked. Burris motioned to the large building. If they're anywhere, they're going to be in the supercenter, he mused. Let's move in quick and silent, get in there and scope it out. He paused for a moment to formulate a plan. Corporal, take Sterling up front. I want you to clear us a path. If the creatures are manageable, take them down, and if there's a pack, just knock them to the ground, and Bingham and Hardham will take care of them. Stinson and I will focus on the door, getting it open one way or another. Questions? Everyone shook their heads in the negative. Let's move then, Burris barked. The soldiers got up, breaking out their blades, readying them for combat. They walked casually down the road, getting off into the grass that led to the parking lot. Once they hit the pavement, they moved slowly, not wanting to alert creatures to their presence with heavy footsteps. The only ones aware of them were the ones closest to them, with Sheehan and Sterling quickly knocking them out with knife strikes to the head. As they moved towards the front entrance of the supercenter, Burris kept a close eye on the ghouls in the distance, making sure they were keeping to themselves, which they were for the most part. As they approached the front of the supercenter, Sheehan started making a clicking sound with his mouth, getting the attention of the creatures at the front of the doors. The ghouls turned and began moaning with excitement at the unexpected fresh meat before them. There were seven of them, all tightly packed together. Let's take out the trash, Sheehan said with a grin. Sterling nodded and the two of them stepped forward, grabbing the first few zombies by the shirt and yanking them back, allowing Harden and Bingham to take them down. The leading duo stabbed the next set, shoving them backwards into the others, causing them to stumble. This gave them an opportunity to go forward, stabbing to their heart's content, finishing them off. Once the path was clear, the four soldiers formed a semicircle around the door, preparing for an attack, looking towards the far end of the complex, and seeing zombies starting to shamble in their direction. Nine seconds before summer on us, Sarge, Sheehan said. Maybe three minutes before things get interesting. Plenty of time, Burris replied, and went up to the door, looking through the glass into the darkened interior, straining to see. There was a little bit of movement, but nothing that appeared to be moving too quickly. Anything? Stinson asked. I think it's dead inside, but we're going to make sure, the sergeant replied. He used his knife to try to break the lock on the sliding doors. Stinson helped, doing the same, and it took them a few moments, but they finally managed to pop it open. We're in! The group piled through the door, Sheehan bringing up the rear and securing the door behind them. Sheehan, Harden, make sure we have an escape path, Burris instructed. We might have to leave here in a hurry. Copy that, the corporal replied. 
As the two soldiers grabbed a couple of shopping carts, preparing to use them as battering rams if necessary, the rest of the group went inside. They pulled out flashlights so they could see what they were facing, knives at the ready. Only Private Stinson had her rifle at the ready, just in case. They moved quickly down the main aisle, looking side to side down each for trouble. They made it halfway down the store before they found it. At the main cross-section of the store, Burris stopped them dead in their tracks as they looked to each side. There were a few dozen zombies on either side who immediately turned and growled at their presence. Back, 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 the sergeant cried. Everybody turned and bolted back towards the front of the store, moans and footsteps growing louder behind them. Sheehan, we gotta go, Burris bellowed as they got closer. Sheehan turned and spotted his companions running for him, smacking Harden on the arm to get his attention. To get in close, he said. Push him back and give us a lane. Let's do it, Harden said. Sheehan pulled open the sliding doors, and the two of them rushed outside, using the carts to smack into a few zombies that were close to the door. A couple of the ghouls stumbled backwards, but one flipped over headfirst into the cart that Harden was pushing. All he could do was continue to shove it forward as the confused creature flailed about, trying to get free. They smacked it into several others, knocking them down. By the time they shoved the carts forward, letting them go, and retreated back, the others were out of the store, shoving the sliding glass doors behind them. Guess they weren't in there? the corporal asked dryly. Burris shook his head. Nothing but the dead, he said. Why were they locked up in there? Sterling asked. Stinson shrugged her shoulders. Back door left open, maybe? she asked. But honestly, does it really matter? Guess not, Sterling admitted. Everybody back in the vehicles, now! Burris barked. The group took off running, moving swiftly through the lot and back to the relative safety of the hillside. They looked down at the zombies slowly shambling in their direction. Pretty safe to say that if they did evacuate, they didn't come this way, Burris said. Where would they have gone, though? Sheehan asked. Surely they wouldn't have gone deeper into Portland. Nothing but trees to the west, too, Harden added. Stinson pulled out the map, studying it for a moment. She tapped on the apartment complex and surveyed the surrounding area, finding a highway and a river running to the east. There are some small towns to the east, she piped up. Maybe they went that way? Could be, Boris said. But we don't have to worry about that at the moment. How close are we to the apartment complex? Stinson checked the map. Ten, fifteen miles, she said. That's our next target, Boris said. We check it out, see what's there, then we can decide if we want to go further. She hand-cocked a brow. What about Captain Odom? he asked. I'm sure he'll be pleased with whatever report we draw up, Boris replied. But I want to at least check out their base. If nothing else, they may have a stockpile that would be useful. If they had to leave in a hurry... Bingham added. That's what I'm thinking, the sergeant said with a nod. They couldn't take it all. Come on, back to the cars. Let's get this knocked out. The group headed to the vehicles, looking back towards the mob of undead ghouls that were slowly trying to catch up to them. Chapter 6 Zion, Calvin, and Mateo drove towards the apartment complex they once called home. Zion paused on the interstate before making the turn, looking out at the destruction the chain-spinning devices had caused. Hundreds of corpses lay on the ground, missing parts of their heads and other bits of their bodies, laying in piles around them. Calvin, you got yourself a hell of a girl there, Zion said, shaking his head. The shorter man puffed out his chest. Don't I know it, he said. Those things look wicked, Matteo commended. They did not mess around, Zion said. If we have time, once we get Adam out, of course, we need to grab these and bring them down to White Salmon. Couldn't hurt to have some of these at the ready for when the next group of those things decides to invade our home. Calvin nodded. Remind me, and I'll let Fingers know, he said. He's been itching to get out of town, and this would be a great project for him. Guess it's probably a good idea to make sure our explosives guy doesn't get bored, Zion quipped, 
and they shared a chuckle as Zion made the turn towards the apartment complex. The drive was a little bumpy, with dead bodies scattered about. When they got halfway up, they could see a small mob of them, forty or fifty, around the building. Rather than fight, Zion pulled off of the road onto one of the trails, leaving the vehicle out of sight. All right, let's hike it, he said. It's a long-ass haul if we find something, Calvin warned. Those things are up against the parking garage, Zion explained. Going to be easier to take them out from inside than fighting them out here. Calvin laughed. Oh, don't tell me that the big bad Zion is tired of swinging that beam around, he joked. Just trying to pace myself, brother, the taller man drawled. I know how you get, and I'm still banking on having to come rescue your ass at some point. Calvin playfully smacked him on the arm as they broke into laughter. Come on, let's get to it, Zion said, clapping him on the back. The group got out, grabbing their melee weapons and guns before walking through a small man-made trail in the woods. Zion and a few of the others had dug it out, just in case they faced a situation just like this. They walked up towards the building, stopping at the edge of the woods, Looking back towards the driveway and seeing most of the zombies were still transfixed on something inside the parking deck. What are they doing? Mateo asked. Squirrel or some other critter probably got in there and got their attention, Calvin suggested. Don't care what it is, as long as it holds their attention, Zion said. Come on. They walked around the back of the building, coming around the corner only to be met by a zombie that had gone off exploring. Zion didn't hesitate despite being startled, smacking the ghoul on the top of the head with his metal weapon and crumpling it to the ground. They breathed easy after the quick scare before continuing up the emergency door to the building. Zion looked inside, making sure that none of those things had managed to get inside the parking deck. When he was sure it was clear, he used his weapon to reach inside and pop open the door release, which Calvin grabbed. They got inside and gently closed the door, trying to limit their noise. As soon as they walked in, they could hear the excited moans coming from outside. Well, so much for that, Zion muttered. Come on. They headed in, walking up the stairs to the main floor. They looked around, not seeing any movement before heading to the main entrance, finding it secure. Doesn't look like anything's gotten in, Calvin said. Or anyone. Mateo added. Guess that's the most important thing, Calvin agreed. I can handle a few of those things, but if someone else has already looted the place, can't really recover from that. Okay, we're going to divide and conquer, Zion said, motioning with his hands as he spoke. Mateo, I want you to go straight down this hallway to the cafeteria. The back room should have some food left in it. Grab some bags and start packing stuff up for Adam. Get the lightest weight stuff with the most calories. I don't care what it is, and they won't either if it means they get to keep on living. We can get them a good meal once we break them out. Where am I going to find bags in here? Mateo asked. Calvin waved a hand. Oh, there's a small game room a couple doors down on the right from it, he explained. We had some kids stuff like footballs and whatnot. Should be in canvas bags. Just dump them out and that should do. No problem, Mateo said. I'm hitting the armory, Zion said. I think most of the stuff was cleared out, but I just want to make sure. Calvin, you know where that bow is? Yeah, old Barry's apartment on the top floor, Calvin said. He's an old school hunter like I am, and said he had a bow he had to leave behind. Zion nodded. Then we just need some zipline stuff and we'll be set, he said. Mateo looked at the ground, kneeling and motioning to some long cords running along the base of the wall. Do they have to be rope? he asked. I mean, not really, Calvin replied. Just rope-like and light enough that an arrow could carry it. What about the cord here, then? Mateo asked. Don't know what it is or what it's running to, but can't imagine it's important at this point with nobody here. That's antenna wire for the radio, Calvin said as he inspected the cord. Had to get a boatload of it to get it outside from the radio. Hell yeah, that'll work. 
You two worry about your things, and I'll grab the bow and start rigging that up. Probably head up to the top floor to try out a few shots just to make sure. Before you do that, meet back here, Zion instructed. Fifteen? The other two men nodded in agreement, and everyone ran off to their assigned task. Chapter 7 Burris led his group up the highway towards the apartment complex, slowing the vehicles as they started to encounter piles of dead ghouls in the distance. Finally, he stopped, staring out at the carnage in front of them. What in the hell happened here? Stinson asked. This is a massacre. Come on, let's take a closer look, the sergeant said. He got out of the SUV, prompting the others to do so as well. They spread out on the road, walking carefully through the rotting corpses littering the area. Watch yourselves now, Sheehan warned. These things might not be all the way dead. The group continued to walk through, looking around in astonishment at the carnage. Burris, Sheehan, and Sterling walked over to one of the devices that was on its side. They inspected it, finding chains coming out of it that were covered in guts and bone fragments. This is some ingenious stuff, Sterling said. Get these chains whirling around fast enough, and it would rip right through that flesh. Maybe we should take some notes, Sheehan said. I'm sure the captain would be happy to have something like this deployed. Yeah, sure, Burris said slowly, trailing off, words failing him as he inspected one of the devices. He knew whoever had come up with something like this wasn't an average survivor that they were going to be dangerous. You good, Boris? the corporal asked. Huh? the sergeant asked, startled out of his thoughts, and shook his head. Yeah, just admiring their handiwork. Takes a twisted mind to come up with something like this. If Jinx ever sees this, he's going to be pissed he didn't think of it, Sheehan joked. Hey, sergeant, Stinson called. Check this out. The soldiers all walked over to her at the far end of the carnage. She was standing in between a pile of bodies that was a little bit away from the devices. What is it, Stinson? Burris asked. Look at this, she said, motioning to the corpses on the ground. The corporal shrugged. Yeah, they got decimated by those chains, he said. What's your point? You're not seeing it, Sheehan, she insisted. Look at the circle of destruction from where the chains were spinning. Now look at these things. It dawned on Boris what she meant, and he nodded. They're too far away, he said. Exactly, Stinson said, nodding. I'm still confused, Sheehan admitted. Whoever set these up didn't just set them up and leave, Boris explained. They stayed and fought while they were going. Why, though? the corporal asked. I mean, if you're going to have these, isn't that enough? The sergeant looked up the road, spotting a sign for the apartment complex with an arrow pointing off of the highway. They were protecting an evacuation, he mused, buying as much time as they could for others. He inspected some of the wounds on the ghouls, finding they were different from what the chains would have made. Different weapon, too. Somebody did this with a handheld weapon. Stinson wandered around nearby, looking at the ground. I'm not seeing a blood pool, either she said. So it doesn't like they were eaten. At least, not here. Come on, back to the vehicles, Boris said. We're going to the apartments. Everybody piled back into the SUVs, not sure what to expect when they got there. Boris drove over some of the decaying ghouls on the ground, finally getting through them and making the turn to the road. They drove up, taking care to stay on the winding, wood-lined road. When they got within view of it, they were forced to stop once they saw the zombies against the wall. The main building was directly in front of them, with a parking garage attached, and what appeared to be a single building attached in a single enclosure. Boris sat there for several long moments, debating on whether or not it was worth it to get in there. He sat for so long in thought that Stinson spoke up. Sarge, you with us? she asked. He blinked rapidly, shaking his head. Yeah, I'm good, he said. Just wondering if it's worth it. Whatever you decide, we got your back, she promised. 
Like you said, there could be a trove of goods inside. Yes, yeah, Sarge, and there's not too many of them, Harden added. We can handle them. Boris continued to stare at the complex, debating internally. Okay, he finally said, but we're going to go stealth over brute force. I'm all for it, Sarge, Harden agreed. The soldiers got out of the SUV, the others joining them. They were a few hundred yards away, and the zombies hadn't noticed them yet. How you want to play it? Sheehan asked. Let's cut through the woods, take the long way around, Boris instructed. See if we can find another way in. If we can't, then we'll take them head on. All right, boys and girls, you heard the man, the corporal said. We're going on a nature hike. He motioned for everyone to head to the woods on their left. The soldiers pushed through some brush, trying to stay as quiet as they could. They walked in silence for a while before coming upon the trail. That makes life a bit easier, Bingham muttered. Keep it down, Sheehan scolded. Bingham nodded as they continued to move. The corporal led them up the trail towards the building, keeping on edge as they went. Finally, they made it to the apartments, looking back towards the road and seeing the zombies. More importantly, they were relieved they hadn't been noticed. Sheehan took them around the corner, startled by a dead zombie laying there. He held up his hand, getting them to stop. He knelt down, finding that the head wound was still bleeding the coagulated goop of the dead. He glanced back at Burris, mouthing the word, fresh. Burris tensed up, immediately pulling his rifle to the forefront, getting everyone but Sheehan to do the same. The corporal stuck with his knife, leading the group forward, ready to stab anything that got in his way. They made it to the garage, looking through the opening and seeing the zombies on the other side. Sheehan saw the emergency release door, sticking his head in through the opening just enough to see the release. He motioned for Harden to hand him his rifle, and he did. He used it to lean inside, hitting the door release. As soon as it popped open, Harden caught it, and the group quickly moved inside. Harden gently shut the door, but it didn't latch. They moved over to the stairwell, looking up defensively, aiming their weapons up. Boris pulled everyone together, speaking in firm whispers. Okay, we need to clear this place quick, he instructed. Three teams of two. Harden, Stinson, you take the first floor. Bingham and Sheehan take the second. Sterling, you're with me on the third. Quick sweep of this building before we worry about the second building and whatever is in the middle. Ten minutes and we meet at the stairwell outside the first floor. And if they're hostile? Sheehan asked. Burris paused, internally warring with himself on how to handle this. Everybody get to the center area, he said. Most likely it's open space. So Harden and Stinson, it'll be your job to draw them to the ground floor. The rest of us will set up shooting positions from the higher ground. Don't worry, we'll have you covered. Stinson and Harden glanced at each other, knowing they drew the short straw. But they nodded silently. Okay, let's move, Boris said, and opened up the stairwell door again. The soldiers piled in, not noticing the exterior door fluttering open as it hadn't been latched. It wasn't long before a decrepit hand wedged itself between the door and the frame and pulled it outwards. Chapter 8 Harden and Stinson got up to the first floor, both of them with their rifles up and aimed downrange. They moved down the main hallway that ran alongside the front of the building, aiming each way to make sure they were alone, listening for signs of life. Stinson tapped Harden on the shoulder, pointing out a fire escape map on the floor. They saw it was nothing but apartments if they went down to the right which had another pathway that led to the left and into the courtyard. There was a centre hallway that led to some community amenities, like the cafeteria, game room and other stuff. Stinson pointed that out and motioned for it. Harden nodded in agreement that they should go that way. He playfully motioned for her to lead the charge, prompting her to roll her eyes. 
Stinson took point, aiming straight ahead, hoping that she wouldn't have to use her weapon. She made it to the edge of the hallway, peeking around it before making hand signals to Harden that she was going around, and for him to cover her. She made it to the corner and around, moving to the center of the hallway, moving slowly and aiming towards the doors on either side. The sun at the far end of the hallway coming from the courtyard was slightly blinding, coming directly at her. Harden peeked around the corner, gun at the ready, to make sure she was okay. About a quarter of the way down, she heard movement towards the next set of doors, like something being dumped on the floor. She quickly held up her hand to signal Harden to stay put. She readied her weapon, holding it up but not aimed directly, hoping to retain a little bit of non-threatening facade to whoever was making the sound. A moment later, a tall guy emerged from the door, shutting it behind him with his foot as his hands were full of bags. He took several steps out before looking up, freezing at the sight of the soldier in the hallway. His eyes went wide as he stared in fear at the gun. Hello there, he stammered. Who are you? I'm Private Stinson. I'm with the military, she replied cautiously. Good to know, he replied as sweat broke out on his brow. And you are? she asked, hoping to sound friendly. Extremely uncomfortable, the man admitted. Not my intention to make you uncomfortable, she said, slowly lowering her weapon to aim at the ground. I'm not here to hurt you. What's your name? The man looked petrified, looking at her and glancing back down the hallway. The courtyard was about ten yards from him, making a run extremely difficult. He'd be shot before making it to cover if he ran. I'm Mateo, he finally said. Stinson stayed cautious as well, knowing this situation could go bad at a moment's notice. She continued the small talk, hoping to put him at ease, especially because she couldn't see what was in his hands or on his hip. So, what you got there, Mateo? she asked. Just some stuff, he replied. I live here. At least, I did. Just came back for a few things. She nodded. Okay, not meaning to pry, she replied. You here alone? I got fifty other men upstairs, he replied with a small smile. She blinked at him before she realized he was lying. Yeah, I wouldn't tell me the truth either, she said. Harden kept watch from behind cover. He was too far away to make out exactly what was being said but his finger was on the trigger, and he was ready to act if need be. Come on, girl, get out of the way, he murmured to himself. So, you going to tell me what you're doing here? Matteo asked, gaining a little bit of confidence in his words. We saw that things were bad down here, Stinson explained. Thought we might be able to lend a hand. His gaze darkened. Pretty sure your side has done enough already he said dryly. I know, it wasn't right what they did, she agreed. But we're here to help now. Even if I believed you, it's not up to me, he replied. You're going to have to talk to Zion. I suppose I could take you to him, if you lower your weapon. She nodded, but before she could fully lower it, he took a step towards her. Harden could only see and not hear. So he took this as a hostile act and emerged from cover, raising his weapon. Get down, he yelled. Matteo took a step back in shock, immediately dropping the stuff he was carrying and reaching for his sidearm. Harden opened fire, sending several rounds into his chest. Before Stinson could process what was happening, it had already happened. She dropped her gun and rushed over to Matteo, applying pressure to the wounds. I got you, she babbled panicked. You're okay, you're okay. Matteo was badly wounded, bleeding profusely, coughing up blood. He was barely conscious and struggling for breath. What the fuck did you do that for? Stinson spat the words venomously at Harden. He was stunned, adrenaline pumping from firing. 
but petrified that she was applying first aid and yelling at him. It was clear he'd messed up bad. I... I thought he was going to attack you, he stammered. With what? An empty bag? She snapped. You moron! I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Harden repeated, almost like a prayer. Stinson stared down at Matteo as he let out one more blood-filled cough before going limp. She sat there, stunned, shaking, covered in someone else's blood. Finally, Harden reached down and yanked her off of the floor. Come on, we have to go, he urged. Get to the courtyard. He can't be out here alone. Stinson stared at him in shock. Now, he barked, giving her a shove to move. She snapped out of it, and the two of them ran off to the courtyard to take cover. Chapter 9 Zion looked through the armory, or what was left of it. Every gun had been taken, with only some scattered boxes of ammunition left on the shelves. He didn't bother picking them up, not wanting to worry about carrying them. Besides, he knew where they'd be. He chuckled to himself, knowing that this was a waste of time, at least from his perspective. His jovial mood went up in a puff of smoke, however, at the sound of gunfire from the first floor. What the hell? he muttered, and tensed up, grabbing his weapon and exiting the armory. He looked around, making sure it was clear before he ran for the stairwell door. When he made it to the crossover hallway that led to the courtyard, he saw two men out of the corner of his eye who were checking the doors. Rather than continue to run, he stepped back into the opening, looking down the hallway towards them. The sun was shining straight at him, so he couldn't get a great look at them. He clanked his weapon against the ground, sending a metallic sound pinging through the air. Both figures froze. I don't know who you are, but you're in my house, he called. The two soldiers turned, immediately gripping their rifles tightly, but not raising them. Zion was unimpressed. I'm Corporal Sheehan, and this is Private Bingham, one of them said. Zion snorted. Military boys, huh? he drawled. You here to finish the job that your bombs couldn't? He started to walk slowly towards them. He clanged his weapon on the ground as he moved, and still they didn't raise their guns. It's not like that, the corporal insisted. Uh-huh, Zion replied, making it within ten yards and not slowing. Why don't you drop your weapon and we can talk it out, Sheehan suggested. Zion's gaze darkened. Like your boys downstairs talked it out, he demanded. I heard those shots. The corporal's eyes widened. I don't know what's going on, but we can talk, he began but cut off and raised his weapon, aiming directly at Zion when he came within five yards. Zion stopped and gripped his weapon tightly, the tip resting on the ground. So, you're going to come into my house and what? Put me down like a dog? he demanded. Not if I can help it, Sheehan said. Another shot went off upstairs, which caused the corporal to glance up. Zion immediately leapt forward, swinging his weapon up and hitting the gun knocking it to the ground. Bingham tried to get his weapon up, but Zion was too quick. He grabbed the private by the throat, lifting him up off of the ground and driving him down, the back of his head smacking hard into the floor. The force was so great that his skull cracked open and blood pooled around it. Bingham! Sheehan screamed as he retreated, drawing his sidearm. Zion knew he couldn't make it to him in time so he threw his weapon end over end. The metal spiked creation hit the corporal in the chest, causing him to fumble his handgun. As he reached down to grab it, Zion turned and ran towards the courtyard at full speed. By the time Sheehan aimed and fired, Zion leapt over the edge. He flew through the air, reaching out and grabbing a small tree which bent just enough to slow him down and get him to the ground. As soon as he hit the dirt, a shot rang out, hitting the tree beside him. Zion ducked down behind a bench, looking for the offender. There was another soldier about thirty yards away, behind cover. Motherfucker, 
He seethed and glanced towards the hallway leading back into the building. Mateo lay crumpled on the ground. He let out a furious grunt and got up running, sprinting hard to the other side of the courtyard and diving behind a metal fence that enclosed the small dog park. As he flew through the air, several shots came from above, the corporal shooting his handgun from the second floor down at him, narrowly missing. Zion landed hard, quickly rolling back behind cover. Calvin, your ass better not be dead, he hissed under his breath. Chapter 10 A Few Moments Earlier Calvin was at the far end of the complex inside an apartment. It was sparsely decorated, but he wasn't there for the decor. He was there for weapons. He dug through the closet, finally finding the bow he was looking for. Now we're cooking, he declared. He froze at the peculiar sound of a gunshot below him. What the hell? Is somebody shooting? He murmured and listened closely for a few more moments. He shook his head and dug through the closet to find arrows. He retrieved a full quiver and slung it over his shoulder. All right, let's go see what's going on he said, and rushed back to the door, grabbing his rifle as he went. He slammed the door behind him, not even thinking, and looked back at it as if it was the door's fault. Shit, he murmured. Well, can't do anything about it now. He readied his rifle, just in case, and walked down the hallway back towards the stairs, continuing to listen for anything else. As soon as he turned the corner, he spotted two soldiers about thirty yards away, both staring at him with their weapons up. Almost immediately, one of them fired at him, startling him and causing him to drop his rifle while backing up. What the fuck, man? he yelled. He looked down the hallway, finding it was a long stretch of nothing, and he wasn't going to have much of a chance unless he got to cover. Footsteps thundered towards him, and he tried desperately to decide if it was fight or flight. The steps slowed, so he figured that was his best shot. He quickly pulled an arrow and loaded it up, peeking around the corner towards them. Luckily, he was in the shadows, so he had the slightest of advantages. They were fifteen yards away, both of them aiming towards the corner. He readied the arrow, kneeling down to make himself as small as possible before striking. Calvin quickly darted out ever so slightly from behind cover, just enough to get one of the soldiers in view, letting an arrow fly. Several shots rang out almost instantly, but they were off target since he was low. He got back behind cover and quickly scrambled to get another arrow loaded in. As he did this, there was a thud on the other side, and somebody bellowed, Sterling! Sterling! Calvin peeked out carefully. The arrow had found its target, hitting a soldier right in the throat and dropping him to the ground. He stared for a moment, watching the other soldier shake the soon-to-be-dead man, panicking and not sure what to do. He snapped out of it, knocking another arrow and coming out from cover, shooting and hitting the other soldier in the leg. His opponent let out a horrific scream at the extreme pain. More gunshots echoed from below and Calvin knew he had to get to work. But first things first. He loaded up another arrow, keeping it trained on the wounded soldier. The man had dropped his rifle and was reaching for it, but Calvin kicked it away. He aimed at the soldier's head. I wouldn't do that if I were you, he said. The soldier seemed to be having a full-blown meltdown, rage in his eyes as if he could burn the whole building to the ground with the force of his anger. I'm going to kill you, he snarled. You son of a bitch! He flailed about, yelling some more, and reached for his sidearm. If you don't think I'll give you a free tracheotomy, you're gonna have a rude awakening, Bubba, Calvin drawled. Now why don't you take that gun out nice and slow, and slide it on the ground for me? The soldier relented, knowing he was beaten. He pulled the handgun out slowly using his fingertips, and slid it across the floor. 
Calvin kicked it further away as his opponent writhed in pain. A few more shots went off, and the wiry stoner knew he had to go to work. This is going to be uncomfortable, he said, and grabbed the soldier by his shirt and dragged him to a nearby apartment. You got a choice, he huffed as he heaved the man inside. You can come after me right now, or you can go to the kitchen, get some towels and deal with that bleeding. Your call. The soldier seethed, staring him down as Calvin shut the door. Oh, I hope he picks the towels, Calvin murmured under his breath as he got his rifle and rushed out to the courtyard. He looked over the edge, staying low to not give his position away. Zion was pinned down by two shooters on the ground who were spread out. There was also a rifle near the hallway on the second floor sticking out. He did some quick calculations in his head, realizing that the shooter with altitude was the biggest threat. Calvin took a shooting position, aiming the rifle carefully towards the gunman, who was moving around to get a better shot at Zion. Calvin took a deep breath before squeezing the trigger. The bullet flew, hitting the shoulder in the chest. The impact sent him flying back, smacking against the wall. Calvin chambered another round, keeping his sights trained on him. After a moment, it was clear, the soldier was down for the count. He took aim at the soldiers on the ground who were moving up towards Zion's position in the dog park. There were two, about forty yards from each other and moving up from cover point to cover point. Only one of them was firing, keeping Zion pinned down. The other was just moving into a better cover position, not firing. Calvin picked the shooting target first, taking aim and trailing him as he ran across the open courtyard. Come on, take some cover already, he muttered. Finally, the soldier stopped, taking a knee to reload his weapon. Calvin didn't waste time, immediately squeezing the trigger, sending a kill shot into the back of his head. The soldier slumped forward, sliding down the back of the bench and into a lifeless heap. Calvin turned to take aim at the other soldier, but they were running away. She took off towards a nearby hallway vanishing before he could get her within his sights. He did a thorough scan of the area, and there was nothing else moving in the courtyard, and no other shooters on the second or third floor. He was about as certain he was going to be that he'd gotten them all. Zion, you good, buddy? he called. Zion peeked his head up from behind cover, looking around and finally spotted him, giving him a thumbs up. Get your ass up here, Calvin said. I got something for you. Private Stinson ran through the hallway, distraught and frightened, knowing she might be alone. She had to get out of there, because they'd kill her if she didn't. She made it to another stairwell that led down to the garage, quickly busting into it, nearly tripping and falling down the stairs as she did because she was moving so quickly. She took a brief moment to gather herself, knowing that if she didn't get a hold of herself, she wasn't going to make it. Get it together, she hissed. She took a few deep breaths before readying her weapon, aiming it as she went down the stairs. She got to the bottom, finding the door, reading, Parking Garage. She opened the door and stepped inside, but the door slipped from her hand when she did, and it slammed shut. She tried to open it back up, but it wouldn't budge. She looked at the sign reading, Resident Entrance Only. Swipe keycard or use main entrance. Damn it, she muttered, and raised her rifle before working her way through the garage, back towards the door they'd come in through. She was looking around, checking the few cars that were in the garage still, searching for another exit, but not finding one. The bars on the openings were too small for her to fit through, and there was no way back. When she came around the only corner she had, she was stunned. There were twenty or so ghouls in the area with her, some of which immediately took notice of her. They shambled in her direction, essentially trapping her down there. Oh, God, she moaned, racking her brain, trying to figure out a way out of this. She didn't have enough ammunition to get through the mob, and even so, the door was clogged with them. 
All she could do was backtrack, which she did quickly. She ran back, trying every single car door handle she could find. The first few cars were locked up tight, causing her to panic a little. Finally, she made it to the last one, a giant sedan. She tried the handles, and they were locked. Damn it, she stammered to herself shakily. What am I going to do? She tried to keep herself calm, trying to figure something out. But there weren't any doors she could go through, not openings, and the cars were all locked. She finally reached into her pocket, finding the tracking device, relieved that she still had it. Her eyes lit up, and she used the butt of her rifle to smash out the driver's side window, reaching in and popping the trunk open. She rushed around, jumping inside and pulling it down shut. Inside was complete darkness, and it took her a moment to find her flashlight. Finally, she got it on and examined it. Captain Odom, you better have someone watching this, she muttered, and found the switch, clicking it on. She wasn't much of a religious person, but she was more than happy to send out a prayer to anybody or anything that was listening. Chapter 11 Zion and Calvin walked down the third floor hallway. The former extremely pissed, the latter trying his best to hold himself together. The loss of Matteo hit him hard. They hadn't been close, but they'd been through a lot in the last week. And for the military to just swoop in and murder him, it was too much to bear. As they came around the corner, Zion came across the soldier with the arrow in his throat. He pulled it out, wiping it disrespectfully on the dead man's shirt before handing it back to Calvin, who sheathed it. That's a hell of a shot, Zion commended. Calvin shook his head. More luck than skill, he muttered. You were going for a kill shot, weren't you? the taller man asked. Calvin nodded. With them shooting at me and having to launch the shot essentially blind? I'm just happy I hit the target, he said. Kill shot was a bonus. Everything from here on out is a kill shot, Zion said firmly. You understand me? The shorter man nodded, shoulders stiffening. Nobody gets out alive, he agreed. Well, except this asshole. But that's only because we need information. After that, everybody in uniform dies. Something like that, Zion said. Is he in this one? He pointed to the apartment door. Calvin nodded, and Zion approached it, cracking it open a little and taking a breath. Okay, motherfucker. You listen up and you listen good, he yelled with a confident anger that would scare even the mightiest of warriors. My friend and I are coming in there to get you. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, and also tell you what's going to happen if you don't listen. Now, I'm going to open this door and walk right through it. When I do, I'm going to find you sitting on something. A couch. Chair. I really don't care what, but your ass is going to be firmly planted in it. Your arms are going to be straight up in the air, you're going to look me in the eye, and you're going to call me sir. He paused for effect. Now, if you don't meet any of the demands that I've laid out, my friend here is going to keep putting arrows in you until you comply. Now, since we're on a tight schedule, he's not going to start with another limb. He's going to go straight for your goodie bag. And let me tell you, he isn't going to miss, regardless of how small it is. Now, have I made myself clear? There was a long pause before the man inside replied, Yes, sir. I understand, sir. Good boy, Zion said. And just in case you get the urge to try to get the drop on me as I'm walking through the door, just know that if you do, I'm going to rip your nutsack off with my bare hands. Do you believe me? Yes, sir. I believe you, sir, the soldier replied. Good. We're coming in now, Zion warned. He stepped inside, walking in and peeking around the corner. The injured soldier sat on the sofa facing them. His hands were in the air, 
his leg bandaged up, and the arrow that had been in his thigh sat on the coffee table. Zion walked in, sitting directly across from him as Calvin grabbed the other arrow and secured the room. What's your name? Zion asked. Sergeant Burris, sir, the soldier replied. Sergeant Burris, Zion mused, cocking his head. Okay, Sergeant Burris, you and I, we have a lot to discuss. A lot. From the bombs that dropped on our heads, to why your man felt the need to shoot my friend down in cold blood. But there's going to be a time and a place for that. Right now, we need to get moving. Because, if I had to guess, I'd say that your little squad here isn't the only one coming for me. Last thing I want to be is a sitting target. Yes, sir, Burris agreed. Calvin, get me that towel, Zion said. The shorter man tossed him a large dish towel. Zion leaned forward and tied it around the sergeant's eyes. Now, you're not going to speak a word until we get to where we're going. Is that understood? Zion asked. Burris nodded. Good boy, Zion said, and straightened, walking over to Calvin and lowering his voice. Okay, we're going to get him up and go out through the emergency exit near the front of the building. Not the way we came in? Calvin asked. Zion shook his head. Didn't you say one of them got away? He asked. Yeah, came the reply. I'm betting they came in the same way we did, Zion explained. If they left, that's most likely the way they went. Front of the building is the way to go. Calvin nodded. All right, let's get him up and get moving, he agreed. Zion nodded and grabbed the wounded sergeant, yanking him up off of the couch. As they walked, Zion resisted the urge to just take him to the courtyard and throw him overboard to his demise. But he knew they'd need information from him, because he didn't know what they were going to come after him with next. The End <laughs>